Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Gallatin Gardeners Club, and the Rocky Mountain Certified Crop Advisor Program. Montana Ag Live, coming to you tonight from the studios of KUSM here on the campus of Montana State University in Bozeman. We're glad to have you back. I'm Don Mathry, retired plant pathologist. I'll be your moderator tonight. And we have four excellent panelists here with us in the studio. Uh, I'm going to introduce those first. On my far left is Eric Belasco from the Department of Ag Economics and Economics. Uh, he's a specialist on f ag finance and everything related to it. So if you got uh, money questions tonight, Eric's going to be the guy to go to. Our special guest tonight is an old friend. Is really glad to see him back here. Ken Kephart is the superintendent at the Southern Ag Research Center uh, down at Huntley, Montana made a special trip up to Bozeman to be with us tonight. And we're gonna talk about the research centers and what they do uh, a little bit later. So we'll be coming back to, uh, to Ken. Uh, an old friend, Lori Krasinik is here, gonna tell us about all the bug problems that we've seen this fall, if any. So uh, we're always glad to have Lori back. And Tim Seipel is here on my left. Uh, weed specialist, uh, range ecologist, uh, something like that. So anything related to weeds tonight, uh, we're going to turn to Tim. Uh, our phone operator tonight is uh, Nancy Blake. Uh, Nancy's all by herself tonight, so be patient with her. If your phone line is busy, uh, call back and she'll be able to help you out that way. So let's go first to Ken and uh, Tell us about what are the research centers and how do they relate to Montana State University? Well, the, the research centers uh, are, there's seven facilities that are scattered around the state. Uh, the, we refer to these as agricultural research centers. Uh, they conduct research on crop and livestock programs, uh, and I would say programs that are usually unique or adapted to the specific environment where the, where the facility is located. But they're also in, involved in statewide and, and also to a certain degree in regional and, and to some extent in national research programs as well. Uh, so these seven facilities uh, uh, are part of what we call the Montana Agricultural Experiment Station. And there is only one Montana Agricultural Experiment okay. Station in the state. That, and that is the, the unit that represents the research arm of the College of Agriculture. And so, for instance, I have an appointment uh, in, the ag in the Montana Ag Experiment Station. Uh, I spend most of my time on research. I'm also superintendent, so I spend part of my time as the administrator of the facility uh, at Huntley. Um, and I think we have a, uh, a, a connection to the website uh, that we can show, I believe, I oh, know, I guess we're gonna to go to Loria here, I guess, in a moment. But uh, we do have a website we'll talk about, I think, a little bit later that has that shows where those locations are at and the kind of programs that they're involved in. Okay, well, we're gonna come back to you with a lot of questions about the okay. research centers. Um, so, Eric, let's go to you. Uh, food prices seem to be rising pretty quickly at the grocery store, especially beef. Yeah. Can you explain what's happening? Yeah, so uh, over the last year, uh, and you said beef in particular, um, meat prices have gone up by about 15%. Um, a lot of food prices have gone up by about 5%. Um, so I've seen a lot of inflation. Um, and if you look at the reasons why, I think most economists are looking at the supply side for that. So the main reasons are, you know, if you look at wage rates around Bozeman, at least we see everyone's making, you know, the higher wages right now. And that impacts uh, the price of food because, you know, we need to hire people to for logistics and different areas to get food to the tables. Um, and so there's a, there are also some supply bottlenecks that are happening still, uh, not necessarily COVID related, but they are due to more of a, uh, just shipping, like if you've tried to you know, buy something from Amazon, it's taken a little bit to get to you. Um, and so those things have all led to some more food price inflation. Um, it's supposed to slow down a little bit next year, but uh, you know, they're saying, economists are saying, uh, in the range of one and a half to 2% um, next year. So hopefully slowing down a bit. Let's hope so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Um, Lori, uh, this question came from Michelle from Highlight. We have these huge white and gold spiders in our yard this year. What are they? Ooh. This year we've had, I would think this might be the banded Argiope yes. spider, which is a garden spider. They're probably about an inch, inch long. They're kind of white and gold striped. And I've had several questions on that this year. So I, th I think that's probably what it is. They're Argiope trifasciata and they they feed on a bunch of different insects, but they really like grasshoppers too. So since we've had a epic grasshopper year, they're, they're doing their job in the yard. Okay. Yeah. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. They, they don't really come indoors at all. They're just a beautiful thing to see yeah. in the yard. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Tim, is now a good time to control Canada thistle? Now is an excellent time to control Canada thistle. Canada thistle is a plant that has most of its roots below ground. And when we treat it with herbicides, we want that herbicide to go down into the roots below ground. And that happens when the plant is taking its sugars on the surface down into the roots to store them for winter. So this is really actually the best time to get after your Canada thistle with something like glyphosate or 2,4-D. Mm -hmm. would, would you be able to, uh, what about pulling Canada thistle? I, I've heard a lot of controversy of whether if you pull it, you don't get the whole root that you're just spreading it. No, you will not get the whole root. I dug up a chunk of Canada thistle out of my backyard the other day, and I, it had continued to make new sprouts three times where I had defoliated it six inches below the surface. So I dug that root up. Um, out at the F Fort Ellis, uh, east of Bozeman, we have some Canada thistle experiments. And we've dug down to try to find the horizontal rhizomes or the roots that spread underground. And it was a foot before we reached those horizontal rhizomes below ground. So I really think digging it is not, it, it, it's not a, you may wear it down over time and you would have to do it 20, 30 times, who knows, but you're gonna have to keep, you're gonna have to keep at it if, if, if digging it is, is where you're at. Okay. Yep. Okay, Ken, back to you. Uh, you mentioned we have more than one Ag Research Center around. In fact, I think you mentioned there are seven. There are seven yeah. of them, yes. Where are these seven centers located? Do they specialize in anything particular? Uh, most of the centers uh, are involved in what I would say is commercial crop production research. Uh, all of them have a program that's involved in small grains production, wheat, barley, um, uh, particularly in terms of uh, interacting with the breeders here on campus and, and variety development. Uh, our station, we have a station at, uh, at Creston, which is near Kalispell, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, where I happen to start my career as an agronomist. I oh. consider that working summers for Vern Stewart there. Uh, and and they, they do more work probably in pasture management and hay than, than they do at, at most of the other research centers as well. Uh, we have a facility uh, down at Corvallis near Hamilton, and that facility has had more involvement in horticulture, particularly in tree fruit production, and now they're doing some more berry work and things of that nature. Um, uh, the uh, station up at Haver is the one station that still has a, in fact, they have a very large beef cattle program there. Mm. They have a herd of about 400 cows. Thank you for and so there, they have at least uh, two research projects there that are, that are connected with that. But again, we also have an agronomy program there that's, again, working with the breeders. Uh, one of our smaller stations is at uh, uh, Conrad, which is the Western Triangle Station. And they have, again, most of their efforts is sm focused on small grain production. Uh, also doing some work on peas and lentils and, and pulse crops. Uh, one of our, in fact, I believe it is our oldest station is the one that's at Moccasin, Central Ag Research mm -hmm. Center. And again, small grains, a lot of work in alternative crops, a lot of work in peas and lentils, uh, garbanzo beans or chickpeas. Uh, they are also doing more uh, cropping systems type research, looking at alternative crops uh, in rotation. Uh, also, the see, uh, Eastern Ag Research Center at Sydney, uh, that's more like Midwestern agriculture. Them and, and us at Southern mm. have a more diversified agriculture that they serve 
And so they have sugar beets, corn, a lot of more warm season crops. Mm -hmm. and, and that also describes the situation that we have at, uh, at Southern Ag Research Center. Okay, we'll come back to Southern for more details okay. here in a sure. second. But okay. uh, you mentioned that Moccasin is the oldest station. Do you remember or know when it was established? Oh, I think it was 1905, I believe, was, was the year that it was established. Okay. Or 1908, maybe? I've, I've gone on the Pat's tour quite a few times. Is it 1908? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a bang. I've got Dave Wichman uh, celebrated the 100th there, and I've got yeah. a banner hanging on my wall, and I looked at it, and I thought it said 1905. But it, you could be right. It could mm. be 1908. But I think they're... That would make them only two years older than Southern, and I think they're more like five or six years older than Southern. But that's, that's minor. I mean, I don't and know. my understanding is Western was established fairly early, too. Is that right? Uh, the older stations are Southern, which was established in uh, 1910. Uh, Eastern, uh, not Eastern, excuse me, uh, Haver at Northern. That's one of the older stations. And Corvallis is one of the older stations. That's right. Okay. Okay. Um, Eric, uh, this just came in from Bozeman. This person has read that all sectors of Gallatin County are growing except for agriculture. What is a reasonable projection for the farm economy in the future for the Gallatin County? Yeah, so uh, Montana is definitely going through a big change in the labor force. Um, we've seen it in, in Bozeman, at least, um, a lot of new industries coming in, um, especially with people working um, online, uh, people you know, uh, working from their home offices instead of in a physical office. And so the big difference is you see a lot of that expansion kind of move the, the city out. And we've certainly seen that in Bozeman, you know, areas that used to be, you know, uh, growing hay or have cattle on them or dairies are kind of pushed out further and further. Um, and that's not just true for Bozeman, it's true for other areas of, of Montana as well. Um, that being said, some of the best agricultural land is, is also uh, in some of these rural parts away from the cities. And that's where you see more and more of Montana agriculture settling. Um, and so, yeah, the, the dynamics are definitely changing in the big cities. Uh, they're getting younger, new industries. Uh, but agriculture in the rest of the state, I think, um, you know, holds its own uh, and keeps up its traditional, you know, wheat, cattle, bringing in some of those new varieties that are coming from the research centers to kind of keep the future of ag vibrant. What's happened to land prices out in the agricultural areas of Montana? Have they gone up as much as housing prices have? Uh, not as much as housing prices, but they've been steadily growing for, for a long time, especially in, in Montana. Um, there's a lot of um, interest in you know second homes and that, that will drive up the, the price of, of some of those ranches, especially. Um, but you haven't yes. seen the sharp, you know, in, at least in Bozeman, you've seen a real sharp increase in home values in the last year and in other parts of the state as well. Um, yeah, you've seen kind of a steadier rise of, of property values or, or land values outside of uh, some of the city centers. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Lori from Whitehall. Uh, their choke cherry has white scaly spots on it. Is it an insect or a disease? Uh White scaly spots, maybe if they're white or brown scaly spots, some of the things that we've seen with choke cherry this year, or we've seen a lot of pear slug damage, and it, it kind of looks like a disease or could it look, could look kind of scaly, but pear slugs are not true slugs. They're, they're closely related to wasps as adults, and this doesn't really do too, it's more kind of cosmetic damage, but we usually have a couple generations of pear slugs, but I would start looking out. It's a little bit too late this year to do anything about it, so I would, mm -hmm maybe scout in, in July next year and, and see how bad the damage is. And they can be controlled with a lot of contact insecticides. So the only thing left to do with choke cherries is harvest the choke cherries, right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Tim from Facebook, how can I control the neighbor's cottonwood tree roots from totally taking over my yard? Will these roots also damage my home's foundation? So the cottonwood is the weed in this case. Yeah, the cottonwood is the weed in this case. And cottonwood trees can be really weedy, right? They, they continually make roots and suckers that come up. I think most um, sort of weed and feed lawn products or products that have 2,4-D in them for your lawn take, will generally take care of the suckers as they come up if you retreat them fairly often. 
We have that issue right on my in in my yard, and I know to, with aspens and mm -hmm. instead of cottonwoods, and and the 2,4-D does in the weed and feed lawn garden products do do a pretty good job of taking care of those suckers. But you'll have to continually follow follow them, and always they'll always be coming back. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and they've gotten into my sprinkler system. I mean, some of the roots that are, I've got suckers all over my yard, and it's it's, it's pretty extensive how thick some of those roots yep. are, and, and very frustrating. Yeah, mm -hmm. septic drain fields too. There, that will definitely clog up your septic drain field too. Just get rid of the trees, then. I'm working on that. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, let's see here. Uh, Ken, for you, this person's wanting to know. What is the status of soybean production in Montana? Do we have any acres? Well, uh, as it turns out, uh, one of the things I initiated when I, I uh, opened up Southern, opened it back up back in 1998, I had a strong interest in looking at soybeans. I had spent nine years in the Midwest uh, as a state extension specialist for the University of uh, Missouri, and so I had been exposed to soybean production, and and. I couldn't figure out why they would not be adapted to the Yellowstone River Valley uh, of South Central Montana. And so we started a project and started looking at adaptation, looking at maturity groups. And uh, it took us about seven or eight years to figure out a production system. And it turns out they're very well adapted if you pick the right maturity group of, of mm -hmm. soybean varieties. And we figured out of the production system in terms of what worked best as, a, as inoculation, particularly in the early years of production because they are a legume. Uh, and very well adapted. We, can, we usually get 60, 65 bushels to the acre in most years. Yes, we do have some off years like in uh, 2020, we only produced about 48 bushels of soybeans to the acre. It's still pretty respectable though by Midwestern standards, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, protein levels have been 40% plus, and then oil content has been averaging 17.5 to 18.5% oil content. Very marketable product. Uh, our big impediment, and maybe our, our ag economists can help us with that, is, is marketing, because we don't have good market channels for soybeans in the state of Montana. Mm. We do have some producers that are growing them locally, uh, probably have anywhere from two to three. I think we had one year we estimated we had 5,000 acres, excuse me. Uh, there is a people dabbling with them. I have a couple of producers that have been growing them for 10 plus years and are very happy with them. And more recently, the last two years, I've heard a lot of farmers that have tried them ha are now haying them uh, because we had a couple of years worth of research that sh showed that you could grow alfalfa quality forage with them, a high protein content um, uh, for beef cattle. I'll make that as, a, as kind of a caveat. They, because beef cattle are not susceptible to the trypsin inhibitor that can cause problems in, in say, monogastric animals. Okay. But they are haying them and they like them. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they, they, in fact, I've heard there might be even more acreage coming up in the spring of, of 2022 uh, planted just for hay production, so. So Montana's not just a wheat and barley state. No, it's, well, <laughs> we're, we've been working on it, but again, it, it, is, it is the marketing issue that stymies them on, on the sure. green side. Yeah. yeah, well, just to add to that, I think that kind of demonstrates the, the research center's role in kind of establishing that you can actually grow this stuff in Montana. And then, you know, it takes a few years to, like the marketing channels, establishing those. It takes a good quantity. It takes a good group to go out and find out where we're going to send that product. There's not probably not a whole lot in Montana yet, but... Um, I think it's great you guys are working to yeah. diversify that. Well, the other impediment that we have is, in terms of marketing, is that our growers historically have been sugar beet and barley producers, mm -hmm. and, and malt barley producers, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add that on. And they are used to contract, forward contracting their crop. They know exactly what they're going to get or potentially can get for the crop on the day that they plant. And this is a commodity grain. And I have discovered that many of the growers in the valley because this is an irrigated crop, so it's going to be fitting into irrigated rotations, uh, are just not accustomed to dealing with what, what it takes to market a commodity crop like soybeans. And so it, that's been a little bit of an impediment. But we've had them in our rotation, 30, 40 acres for the last 15 years, and it's worked out really well. So there's been a big uh, increase in pea production in Montana. In yes. fact, I think we're one of the top we are the top state producing dry peas in the country, yes. Would soybeans grow in the same areas under the same conditions as peas? 
Uh, peas are probably better adapted to our, our dry land areas. Um, um, I mean, Perry Miller has done lots of work on that, showing that uh, they fit into rotate, dry land rotations, if you will, uh, where they're even in a, even in a recrop scenario where they're using moisture only in the top foot or two or two feet of the soil's profile, which which lends itself to follow up with small grain, which has a much deeper root system mm -hmm. development. Soybeans don't fit into that scheme very well at all. Okay. Uh, no, uh, we've tried growing them under dry land and. And bushels per acre turns into pounds per acre, so oh. it's it has at least in the Huntley area. Now, mm -hmm. in the very north east corner of the state, where they tend to have more of a rainfall pattern similar to the Midwest, mm -hmm. they may fit in <laughs> in a dry land system. So uh, back to you, Eric. With hay prices so high in Montana, how are cattle producers supposed to make any money in the cattle business, and why are hay prices so high? That's a yeah, that's a good question. Um, so hay prices, they'll follow the weather. If uh, we have a very dry year this year across most of the state, there's a few spots that are, you know, exceptionally dry. Um, and, and they tend to be also where there are a lot of cattle, you know, southwest Montana and, and northeast Montana. But really the whole state is under some kind of drought. And so, yeah, hay prices, you know, I'm seeing like $200 a ton. Um, at the same time, cattle prices are going up. And so I think a lot of a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, is that, is that cattle price sufficient to keep that herd or should we be selling them? Um, and so, yeah, it's a real, it's a real economic trade-off, um, but it, it just depends on what kind of capacity you have to, to bring in hay, uh, what kind of, what's your break-even price. Um, yeah, but it's, it, there's definitely a lot of volatility in the hay market because it's directly related to that weather. Where can a hay producer or a cattle producer uh, buy hay now? Is there hay being produced any place that's uh, close by? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's that's the thing is, you know, when you when you start growing hay, you never know what the conditions are going to be in the in the summer, right? So, um, yeah, you you just you kind of have what you have. Um, I think that usually hay tends to be a pretty regional market, but it opens up as that supply gets limited. You see it open up to to more and more areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Lori, I'm going to. Uh, bump this over to you. Uh, here's a new book. Maybe you'd like to talk about this book. I think you're one of the authors, mm -hmm. and uh, it's yeah. something our viewers might be interested in getting a hold of. Yeah, so this is Pest Problems in Identification of Ornamental Shrubs and Trees in Montana. So this is something that a few of us in the Scudder Diagnostic Lab worked on, and it has a section on plant identification, then has a section on uh, on insect identification and diseases. And, and I think that's what, yeah. And it also has abiotic issues, so things that aren't related to any insect or diseases. And this is free through the ex extension store right now. You could get a PDF version, you could also get a hard copied version, and this is something that we was funded through our integrated pest management grant. So it has a lot of great pictures in here, a good index in the back where you could go and look for a spruce tree, pests of spruce, and, and just has a lot of great information in here. So please try to check this out. We're yeah. put a lot of time into this and we're, we're pretty proud of it. Oh, I think you should be. And uh, my goodness, for free. For free. That's quite a deal. So <laughs> yeah. I think the viewers ought to get a hold of that if they can. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, Tim from Bozeman, um, can you recommend a chemical treatment for bellflower besides Roundup? Tell us about bellflower, so, first of all. So bellflower, if you walk around Bozeman, especially in the older neighborhoods, and you look, you'll see this rhizominous mat of little leaves growing on the surface, especially in the shade, especially in some garden, in, your, in the edges of old flower beds and gardens. And so that's, um, it's a bellflower species. Um, and it has these purple bell flowers that'll show up on it. And it's somewhat pretty, um, <laughs> but it is a really a tough weed in a lot of places to deal with. And so it, it, it can be tough to deal with. And so the person has to, you can use glyphosate and it will control it mostly. You'll likely have to reapply it a couple times. If you don't want to use glyphosate, which is Roundup, you can use sort of a, a lawn, 
um, a lawn 2,4-D sort of herbicide that kills only the broadleaf weeds, and that will work pretty well on controlling the bellflower, but you're gonna have to follow it up a little bit. If it's mixed into your flower bed and you have some desirables, you can't go spray the whole thing. <laughs> so what I do is I take a Q-tip and I, or a little rag and I wipe it on the individual leaves to keep the desired plants that I want and hopefully kill the bellflower. Just takes a little time and effort. Yep, takes yeah. a little time and precision. That's precision precision management. <laughs> okay. Um, Ken from Helena, are the research centers doing research on organic farming or perennial crops? Yes, yes. Well, I mentioned uh, any of the stations that are doing work on forages are going to be involved in perennial crops, you know, of that nature. Uh, I'm, at the present time, we do not have a research center that's focusing on organic production systems per se. Uh, we, do have, uh, we do have some research going on with what's called cover crops uh, in rotations, and it turns out that that is related to, could have an application in terms of organic systems, simply because there's nothing registered for, for selective control of either weeds or other pests. Uh, in those species and so there is some of that including at Huntley we have a gentleman that does do some cover crop, crop research uh, but no we do not have a research center that's dedicated per se to organic production systems. I'm part of a organic research project with Dr. Pat Carr, Dr. Zach Miller at okay. Western Ag and at Central Ag and we've been looking at managing field bindweed and Canada thistle in organic systems. And those are two of the toughest weeds to manage in organic systems. And we've been doing that in Corvallis mm -hmm. and also up in Moccasin. Mm -hmm. Had any success yet with bindweed? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, a little bit of success I could say we've had with the two. And, you know, managing weeds in organic cropping systems is really the most difficult part of organic <laughs> cropping systems. And we've switched, so we've had some different rotations, some that Ken was talking about. And alfalfa, over a fairly long period of three to four years, you can wear down the bindweed and you can wear down the thistle at least to keep it from expanding more. When you have those annual crops in there and those annual crop rotations, the thistle and the bindweed just gets away from you in organic systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very difficult. I'm a member of the Gallatin Gardeners Club and uh, weed control this year was one of our huge issues. And I kept telling our members, this is the year where we find out how many weeds can we tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> You're never gonna get rid of all of them. No. <laughs> um, Eric, uh, what is the economic value of the research done here at MSU and on the research centers? If somebody ever looked into putting a dollar figure on that? Yeah, economists do that all the time. Um, that's what they like to do, the cost-benefit analysis. So you invest a dollar into public research. Um, and, you know, there, there are estimates. It, it obviously depends on where you are and what commodity you're talking about. But, you know, the most recent estimates have been around, you know, for every dollar you put in public R&D, so to the research centers, um, you see about $10 back to, the, uh, to society. So that could be... You know, you're developing new varieties that farmers, at, you know, and, and different breeders could use immediately. And maybe like after five years, they start to see the benefit of that. Um, over the last 30 years, we've seen crop prices fall. And, you know, especially for major grains, a lot of that is just because of the research that we've been able to put into some of those products using different inputs, different, uh, you know, chemicals, different management strategies, you know, that are... Uh, kind of pays dividends to, I would say, the future generations. We see a lot of that benefit, you know, five to 30 years out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so the research center, the stuff they're working on now, hopefully the stuff that, you know, our kids, when they're in agriculture, will really benefit from. Okay. Uh, from Livingston, uh, Ken, probably you could best answer this. What new crops are being researched at the university? What new crops are being new, researched? New crops, yeah. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's um, uh, the work we've done doing at Huntley, obviously, with soybeans is an introduction of a, of a crop from another production area. Uh, the idea being that there's a market. If you get outside the state, there's a very strong marketing infrastructure for that. And, and my, in my years of working in alternative crops or new crops, 
big frustration is there is no marketing infrastructure for any of this. Yes, you you can figure out how to grow tons of the stuff, but what do you do with it? You know. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I think that's also where the impetus came on, on a lot of the work on peas and lentils and, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, we used to have a breeding program in safflower, uh, used to have a very strong safflower industry, particularly up in the northeast corner of the state. That's diminished somewhat. That program no longer exists, and I think they depend mostly on materials developed by private industry now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one of the impediments to that is we used to have a processing facility at Culbertson, and that no longer exists. And so that kind of, uh, again, that dealt a blow to our marketing options in terms of where that crop was going towards. Uh, we have lots of interest in int trying to do intercropping, particularly on a dry land basis. Uh, Dr. Kent McVeigh, and I think we were going to talk about this at Southern, is our cropping systems person, and he's looking at intercropping chickpeas or garbanzo beans with flax, uh, two oil seed or one oil seed crop and one, one grain crop. Uh, vastly different seed sizes harvested together. You could clean out, separate one from the other. That's not a novel concept, but it's very much interesting because that would bring intercropping to the state of Montana that we haven't had before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are some new things, interesting things. I uh, uh, have one scientist I know that's revisiting faba beans, uh, looking at faba bean production again. Uh, and then we're also looking, at, I know we have a scientist that's right now looking at mung beans. Uh, again, these are all things that are grown in other regions of the United States that we're trying to revisit. Mm -hmm. uh, really haven't looked at anything, I would say, that would be new, new, say, exotic that I'm aware of. We're still restricted by our climate, aren't we? Restricted, <laughs> it's our climate. And, yeah. and, and I know one of the frustrations is they say, well, gee, all we do is grow wheat, barley, wheat, and barley. We spent 100 years developing a production system for wheat and barley that's probably one of the world's finest. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's, you know, that's a tough act to follow, uh, yeah. uh, to do the same thing for something else that's not as well adapted to the state. Yes, climate, rainfall patterns, the whole thing, it makes a big difference. For sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori from Missoula, she has a terrible problem with flea beetles in tomatoes and potatoes. She's used seven, but it's not working well. Are there better insecticides or other treatments? Yeah, uh, well, first I wanted to just mention, I, I think I forgot to say where we could get this guide. And so you could go to msuextension.org. And I think it, it's either under publications or the store. And you could go to, uh, and then just Google uh, a guide to pest problems and identification of ornamental shrubs in Montana. So make sure you go to the msuextension.org store. Uh, but for your flea beetle question, uh, seven seven can work, but I mean, I mean there's, they're so mobile that it's hard to get a contact insecticide on a, on a flea beetle. So I think if, if you can, next year, if you could start off with, with maybe some, some uh, more established, you know, as long as your plants are maybe seven to eight inches long, you should start with some, some uh, larger starters that might help. And you also have, maybe can do some trap crops like, like radish, uh, but they're very difficult to control with a contact insecticide just because they're, they're so mobile. But I, I think there, there are a lot of other contact sprays you could use, but a lot of them will just have the same, it's just a matter of contacting them, and I think that's the issue. I heard from a, a, another colleague that's involved with the farmer's market that they use 10% molasses to control flea beetles. Oh. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty skeptical. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard of that uh, treatment? Uh, of course, it would be approved for organic production if somebody were an organic producer. Anything to that? I, I, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. <laughs> Let me know what you find out <laughs> if <Okay>. you would. <laughs> uh, okay, Tim, uh, do we have water hemp in Montana? And what is water hemp and why should we be asking the question? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a really good question. So. <laughs> Water hemp is not related to hemp, cannabis sativa, as we would think about it. Water hemp is actually a pigweed species, so it's an amaranth species. And it's very common in the Midwest, yes. um, especially the northern part of the Midwest, where it's a really problematic weed in, in soybean production, sometimes in corn production. It's been way, making its way north and west over the last few years towards Montana, it's now much more common than it was in, in North Dakota than it used to be. And we've actually found water hemp now two times in Montana, 
one time in 2020 in Roosevelt County in a sugar beet field. And then this year, it, we just identified another sample. So we have two recorded incidents of it in another sugar beet field in Prairie County. So mm. all you guys out there in, the, in your irrigated sugar beets especially, walk those fields and scout those fields looking for water hemp mm. now. It's a, it's a dioecious species, meaning there's a male plant and a female plant, which are actually like hemp. But, and so you, you'll see it, it's a big bushy kind of pigweed. If you don't recognize it as our normal red root pigweed, then send it into the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. The reason we're so concerned about it is, is because it's evolved a lot of resistance to herbicides in the Midwest. So glyphosate, all our ALS inhibitor herbicides, it's mostly resistant. So it could have a really large economic impact on our cropping systems, especially in those sugar beet soy kind of areas along the Yellowstone. So that's why we're really pushing prevention and scouting and getting out there and looking at looking for that water hen. Mm -hmm. And if they have any questions, they can contact me um, and I can help them identify it. Or if they suspect they have it, su submit a sample to the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. Something to be watching for. Yeah. Always. Always, huh? <laughs> okay, Eric. Um, the drought in Montana seems really bad this year. Mm -hmm. uh, other places too, probably. How is it currently impacting agriculture in Montana? Yeah, so the, the drought has certainly impacted all of the, the West. So Montana has been affected. It started in California very early on and it's kind of spread. Um, but yeah, if you look at a map, the, the range of the drought is, is basically the whole West. And we've seen kind of the fire season fall that as well in that drought, drought region. Um, and so in Montana, you know, ranchers, obviously their, their biggest problem right now is trying to find hay and trying to find feed. Um, trying to make that decision of, you know, should we keep, can we, can we find that hay? Should, you know, we keep the herd or should we sell the herd? Um, for crop producers, they're a little more, uh, you know, used to that kind of uh, fluctuation from year to year. Um, and so there, there are some programs there. Hopefully a lot of the wheat producers will have crop insurance, for example, so they'll be adapted to that. And the other thing with wheat is given that the drought isn't just in the West, we've also seen drought in other countries. So some of the supply shortages in uh, Russia and uh, Canada has a supply shortage. There's just a global wheat shortage this year, which has helped to boost at least the spring wheat prices up. So if you're selling spring wheat, your yields are going to be low, but uh, the prices are going to compensate for, for some of that. Okay. Um, so I'm a wheat, winter wheat producer, let's say. Yeah. Uh, you need moisture in the soil to get that crop germinated this time of the year. Mm -hmm. Do you, should you go ahead and plant and just hope it's gonna rain or what do you do? What's your uh, process oh of thinking about this? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, the, the winter wheat prices aren't, aren't quite as favorable as the, as the spring wheat. And so, uh, you know, there's a little less incentive, I guess, to put that in the ground, but you're, you're absolutely right. You're kind of banking on some of that moisture at least. Um, and far be it from an economist to tell you, a farmer, what to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you just got to make sure that you have the right risk management strategy in place. Uh, most of the crop insurance programs that are available to farmers do insure against that yield. So if you're thinking about a winter wheat crop, putting it in there and just making sure that you have the right risk management strategy in place, just in case it is another dry winter or dry spring next year. Mm -hmm. Ken, back to you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about some of the specific uh, projects you have there at the Southern Research Center. Well, we have, uh, <clears throat> currently we have uh, three research programs, uh, my own. I spend a great deal of my time in cultivar development and germplasm evaluations for the breeding programs that are here on the main campus, winter wheat, spring wheat, uh, the malt barley program, and, uh, and Durham. And then occasionally I help out with some other pro projects that might be involved in some aspect of breeding, uh, uh, early evaluation of that material. I also do the on-farm or the on-state uh, dryland corn. Um, and so, and then, and then I have also been the primary contact. You'll probably be shocked by this, Don, but I actually am a, am a part-time pathologist. I, I, uh, or a closet, I knew you did Maybe well a closet in pathologist is a better way to put it. But, but I, for many years, I worked with Barry Jacobson and Jessica Rupp on the uh, rhizoctonia root rot problem, that managing that in sugar beets, and so we worked mm -hmm. on that. Um, 
Uh, our second program is Dr. Kent McVeigh. He's, uh, I mentioned earlier, he's our cropping systems specialist. He also has a, a partial extension appointment, so he has some statewide uh, of uh, crop reduction. And then we have a resident weed science program. Uh, uh, for many years that, that was manned by Dr. Prashant Jha, who has since moved on to another university. And his replacement, uh, Dr. Lavrit Shurgill, is now on staff, been on staff for about a year. And he's continuing the work that Dr. Jha started, particularly in the areas of, of herbicide-resistant weeds. Uh, one of the things that, that the station was involved in early on was figuring out the mechanism for how uh, Kosha was developing resistance to glyphosate, and it was very, very interesting, his involvement in that work, um, uh, looking at the genetic aspects of it. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, the station's been very much involved in a whole, whole host of things. Good. Uh, Laurie from Laurel. Uh, my apple tree's leaves are all curled up and dried out with some webbing and black spots. What is it? Uh, sometimes with apple, a lot of times we have the areified mites that will cause some brown spotting, but they usually don't cause curling in the leaves. So we have had a, a lot of problems this year with a pest called the apple and thorn skeletonizer, which will definitely have some webbing and some insect excrement called frass in there. So that's, that's what I would think it would be. And, and, and I, it's a little bit too late now to control it, but, but just it's often kind of patchy, maybe just something to keep an eye on for next year. But mm -hmm. it doesn't usually cause too much damage to the apple tree. But Would spider mites be a problem in apples? Spider mites could be a problem in apples too, but I don't see that as often as I see some we, of Because in the Yellowstone, we've had spider mites in everything this year. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it was, it's been really bad. It's been a really bad spider mite mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just July and August, once it starts to mm -hmm. dry down and we don't have any moisture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. That, it could be spider mites too. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm with the webbing, kind of makes me think that it's a, it's a caterpillar. How about codling moth this year? I think I lost every apple in my tree to something. I'm assuming it was codling moth. Yeah, I didn't get too many coddling moth questions, so I don't know how widespread it was across the state, but I mean, we do have it every year in pretty much every <laughs> county. It's just one pest that just won't go away for some reason. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Tim from Red Lodge, uh, why is yellow sweet clover not considered noxious, and how can you, how can you control it? Ooh. Is it a weed? Uh -huh. um, you know, a weed is someone's definition, and you know, it's a it's a, a weed can simply be defined as a plant out of place. Yellow sweet clover, um, its scientific name is Melolotus officinalis. It is a biennial weed. So the first year it germinates and it grows, we actually use it as a cover crop, believe it or not, and it grows to be about an inch or two tall. And then the next year it grows to be two or three feet tall and makes a whole bunch of yellow flowers. And it then flowers make seeds and then it dies. So we have years in Montana where we have a lot of yellow sweet clover and then the next year you won't see very much because it's all the real small stuff in between years. And it is definitely a weedy plant. It, it can take over your fields, your pastures, your things like that. It provides pretty good forage. It also provides a, as a good source of nectar for honeybees. So I know a lot of people who mm. put out hives out in Garfield mm. County, out in some other counties in Montana, and where there's a lot of yellow sweet clover, and those bees really like that nectar source. Um, it's not, it is a very invasive weedy species, but it doesn't have the economic impact, the negative economic impact to be viewed as a noxious no. weed. Noxious weed is actually a legal term in, sta in state law statutes that's, that has a definition and you are by law supposed to control it. But this one doesn't have as large enough an economic impact and actually has a few benefits, so it's not considered a noxious weed. Okay. Uh, Ken from Great Falls, when will the research centers solve the sawfly problem, or have they? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. No, they have not solved the sawfly problem. Okay. Uh, our, our breeding program have continued to produce uh, sawfly resistant varieties. Uh, we do have some researchers that are working on, on novel sources of resistance, trying to develop novel sources of resistance, and also looking at uh, continuing to look at the ecology of the insect and the problems 
it presents. Uh, you know, one, one of the things is that, that for many years we've talked about is that oats are basically immune to sawfly. And if we could figure out why oats are immune to it, you know, should be able through genetic manipulation move that, move that resistance over into other crops, particularly wheat and barley that are fairly closely related. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet. No, sawfly is still a, a significant problem and, and I guess the severity of it, like, like most insect problems, waxes and wanes. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was so dry, I, think, I don't think the crop even got developed far enough for sawflies to saw it down this year. I think, but, so we didn't hear a lot about it, but it's still out there. Our breeding program has continued to produce solid stem or semi-solid stem varieties that have better yield almost with every generation that's released. And some of those now are approaching the yields of conventional varieties that, that they attain in the absence of the, of the pests. So, so that's coming along. So we're still addressing the problem, but we haven't come close to solving it. Well, it's, uh, but there's a lot of effort on it. There's a lot of effort on yeah, it. Yeah, that's it, right. A lot of effort on it. In fact, one of our faculty members at the Conrad Station uh, recently hired uh, is going to continue some work on that that was started by a previous scientist there. So, mm -hmm. Good. So, Eric, uh, tell us a little bit about your own particular research program that relates to Montana agriculture. Oh, sure. So, so I'm in the Agricultural Economics Department. Um, away from the, uh, but, but I'm still associated with the Montana Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, I focus mostly on agricultural policy. So I actually teach a class, we're going over the history of ag policy next week, and we'll talk about the Hatch Act, which uh, you know sort of delegated those funds to land grants so that they could be used for research and to you know, keep the US ag system competitive uh, you know, going forward. And so um, I spent a lot of time on that, uh, focusing on crop insurance and how farmers can use that uh, effectively to manage risk, especially with yield and drought becoming uh, ever more uh, frequent. And then also just, you know, trying to keep track of prices and see where they're going. And, um, you know, people often have questions about, well, why are, you know, hay prices so high like we had earlier today? Um, so just try to keep a hand on those things is kind of my role as an economist. One of the things I hear about is, quote, the farm bill. Mm. But I haven't heard much about it lately. Is this something that comes up like every five years or something like that? And if so, where are we in that, quote, farm bill process? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, so it's every four years. Uh, the last one, let's see if I'm going to get my years right here. Uh, I believe it was 2020, 2018. 2018 we had the last one, December 2018. And so with it being every four years, there is talk about what's going to be in the next farm bill, but it's very preliminary. Um, and the way that the ag committees kind of move forward is they have what are called listening sessions. And obviously those have not happened, uh, you know, because of COVID. But I know there are a lot of plans for, you know, both of those committees to start having listening sessions. And really that's just an opportunity for the ag committees, both in the Senate and the House, to get some insight from from farmers and farm groups on sort of well, what what's missing, you know, in, in the current ag policy environment. Um, and so hopefully, you know, they'll move towards a farm bill, which would be, you know, 2022, probably better 2023, just given the delays and some of those listening sessions. Do you personally get involved with the farm bill? No, I, you know, I'm pretty good in economics. I'm not so good in the political economy okay. side <laughs> of things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, certainly the, uh, you know, as an economist, and I'll have a lot of colleagues as well, when, when a new program is introduced, you know, we'll certainly look at it and kind of see what the costs and the benefits are of, of some of those different programs. I mean, one of them, there is a, a section in there on, on research and development that will be, you know, in there. And Congress is always trying to decide how much money to delegate to, you know, agriculture through that mechanism. So uh, there certainly seems to be a little more momentum to invest in some R&D, especially with regard to um, creating more drought resistant agricultural systems. Is there any discussion of policy that would change insurance, crop insurance programs to include mm -hmm. other crops or to bring whole soil health into context in any crop insurance programs or anything? Like yeah, that? that's a good question. So th the first part is yes, there's yeah. always kind of an expanding suite of crop insurance programs. And they're, they're usually what will happen is you'll have, let's say we start growing more soybeans in Montana, we want to you know be covered under kind of the general program. Um, then 
the private company would then propose it to the federal government and they would evaluate it and make sure that it made sense. And that's, there's been an expansion of products um, over time. Um, there has been, th that's I guess the other issue in the farm bill, and you, I'm glad you brought it up, is trying to pair risk management with um, more soil conservation um, to try to find maybe a little more compatibility between the risk management and just um, you know, soil health indicators. That's not really something that has lined up well in the past. And th there does seem to be a little more momentum to try to line those programs up a little bit better in the future. Okay, uh, Lori uh, from Big Fork. I have several grayish beetles about an inch long with long antennae on my siding and have a bunch of pine trees on my property. Are these beetles hurting my pine trees? Hmm. Well, those kind of sound like pine sawyer beetles. And I've, this is the time of year where you'd probably see a lot of pine sawyer beetles. And they attack stressed pine trees and uh, mostly dying pine trees. So it depends on how many trees you have on, on your property, but I, it would be an indication that somewhere along the way or your neighbors have some sort of stress pine. So I would just keep an eye on your trees and, and make sure that they're, they're healthy. But this is one that we see quite a bit and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would just, uh, there's, there's some stress trees surrounding. I'm just not uh -huh. sure if it's hurting your trees or not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tim, can I graze my kochia? You can <laughs> graze kochia. Um, some people really like it. Right now, this we really have to be careful about nitrate levels in forages and the problems that they can cause for your livestock. So if you're grazing kochia that's mixed with a whole lot of grass and it's not that much kochia and, and, and there's some grass in there, then I think you can probably get away with it. I would be very cognizant and make sure you test that n those nitrate levels. And your local county extension agent can help you test nitrate levels in forages so you know if you have a problem, a potential uh, problem in poisoning cattle or livestock. Okay. Ken, we're getting down to the end of the program and I was just curious, are there any things about the research centers that we haven't discussed that you'd like to to bring up. Oh geez, there's, there's <laughs> more more to discuss than I could probably think of sitting here on the spot with that question. But but uh, one of the things we haven't talked about is how does the research centers, um, uh, you know, we, we technically, most of us are not tied to the MSU Extension Service, but we do have a desire to share our information with, with area farmers. And so that's been one of the struggles we've had. You know, we're encouraged to publish in, in scientific journals, but but that audience could care less about, about that avenue of, of publication. Uh, so for instance, at Southern, we've hev heavily invested in a, in a, in a website uh, where we have, uh, uh, have loaded up a lot of the annual progress reports that are related to, to particularly the commodity uh, uh, projects that are involved. Like we, again, we have a lot of research that's funded by Montana Wheat and Barley, and we maintain a website uh, page just for those projects on the research centers that are that are performed every year um, and and that's easy to get to and and view and so we've spent a lot of time on that uh, I think what they're showing right now is the uh, is the website for the research centers in general if you go down if you on, if you are on this site you're able to find all of the websites for the individual stations including the Southern Ag Research Center so we're not the only ones that are doing this as well uh, because we have Kent McVeigh, our extension specialist, we, he also has a number of web-based tools. Uh, you can select varieties on our site. You can ask for information on water use, irrigation scheduling, uh, herbicide selection. Uh, you know, he's done a nice job of putting those things together. Uh, yeah, uh, again, that's the Department of Research Centers there. And again, you can see where this, the various locations are at or across the state. But this is one mechanism that we focused on in, in getting this information out to help our farmers in a more timely fashion. Um, okay, well, we're getting down to the last minute and I certainly want to thank Ken, you for taking the time out to come over from uh, Hundley today and uh, wish I, you a safe well, journey. I only had to come from Billings. I didn't have to come all the way. <laughs> okay, well, we wish you a safe journey back yeah. and thanks very much for coming. We also thank all of the sponsors that are putting the money into a PBS here to allow us to have this program each week. 
and uh, we appreciate that very much. We also thank all you folks that called in this week. Uh, only one phone operator, but I know she was kept pretty busy, but did a great job, so we appreciate that. Uh, next week, uh, Ag Live will be back uh, on Sunday, September 26th, and uh, this, the focus of this program is Healthy and Happy Ponies with Amanda Bradbury. She's an equine nutritionist and physiologist here at MSU, so if you've got some interest in horses, she's going to be able to talk about that. And so we hope to see For you back next week. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture,